Right. From the Pacific Northwest, good morning everyone. My name is Steve Byers. Welcome to the fourth presentation in a series of free webinars offered this spring by ALIA as a way of bringing attention and intention to the ALIA Summer Leadership Intensive taking place in Tacoma in June. I'll say more about this extraordinary opportunity at the end of the webinar. We're fortunate to have Caitlin Frost with us today. She wrote in a recent blog post, to be working at the level of depth, breadth, and relationship many of us are being called to in our world, or that is simply showing up on our doorstep whether we feel welcoming or not, it is crucial to have our personal practices that can meet us and support us at our own edge and help us to open beyond our current place of seeing and beyond the places that scare us or shut us down. Caitlin is trained in the work directly with Byron Katie in California and has been a practitioner of the work for 14 years. She works internationally as a facilitator, a leadership and personal coach, and a trainer. She's connected to the work with Byron Katie, of course, the art of hosting community, and she serves as core faculty in the Leadership 2020 Emerging Leadership Program in British Columbia. She's been a participant and faculty of ALIA Institutes in Halifax and in Columbus, Ohio. She's a principal of Harvest Moon Consultants in the Vancouver, BC area, and she lives on Bowen Island, also in the Vancouver area, with her partner, Chris Corrigan, and their children. So Caitlin, please tell us some more about yourself and your work with the work and specifically limiting beliefs. Thank you, Steve. And um, just wanted to say thank you so much to the Alia folks for your continued work in bringing together um, amazing people uh, to share our learning and ideas in this area of work. It's so important in these times for us to be able to learn from each other. So I'm happy to be a uh, part of sharing what I can bring and I'm always grateful to be showing up um, in the ALIA community to be learning from other folks. So um, thank you to all of you and thank you everybody who's here today to um, share in a little bit of learning about transforming limiting beliefs. Um, as one of the part of the Tools for Transformation series. Um, I have been doing this work for about 14 years. I came across this particular practice, uh, the work of Byron Katie, um, in the, probably a, a middle point up till now in my uh, work in the world, in my career, working with groups of people, uh, working with uh, change making, working around uh, leadership practices as a facilitator and a trainer. Um, and came across this particular practice, I've always had an interest um, in also the internal part uh, of how we work when we show up in our work in the world and we show up in groups. Um, and I came across this practice about 14 years ago, um, actually in my own personal journey of attending uh, meditation retreats and looking at uh, that internal side of things, um, and came across this at a particularly challenging time in my own life. Um, it was a time where I had um, been working professionally for many years with, um, with groups and in leadership and um, now had a small baby and a toddler. I had moved to a new community. Um, I had an a amazing partner who traveled a lot and uh, also had come to a time uh, where I was having some challenges in some, uh, in some of the, the personal relationships in my life and my father had just been diagnosed with cancer. Um, and there was just an awful lot going on. And one of the things I noticed was uh, how busy my mind got, how uh, stressful that all was, and how my existing practices of, um, that I used of meditation and being out in nature, which were helping me for sure, um, and then also my problem-solving approach simply wasn't really enough to help me navigate um, through that time and all those things that were happening. And I um, am grateful to have come across this practice uh, in another workshop and really was quite taken with um, the level of uh, learning and the kind of um, peace and understanding I was able to access using this um, seemingly quite simple practice called the work uh, by actually pausing to look at and work with my own thinking to see what is it that I'm believing in these moments that I'm reacting and shutting down, um, getting stressed, um, not knowing what to do to actually have a way, a structure that would help me in pausing 
getting curious about my own thinking and belief patterns, and then having a way to actually engage with those beliefs in a way that I could learn and some of that could shift was quite profound for me. Um, it was another level to me of what I had um, learned in the practices up until in, up until that time. Uh, and so through that period of time, it was uh, profoundly helpful to me. Um, I was using the practice regularly, started to do some study and training with um, Byron Katie in California, um, and started to integrate it into my other work. And it was quite clear to me early on how uh, how much this personal practice really resonated with and was crucial to my ability to uh, do the work that I was doing out in the world with other people uh, at the level that I wanted to be doing it and in the way that I actually felt was necessary, that I wasn't going to continue to show up in those situations uh, where real change was needed, where people were facing uh, huge challenges, uh, conflict, stress, um, problems that they had no idea how to solve. I really realized that if we continued to approach those situations with the same thinking uh, that we had always been approaching them with, we would continue to get the same kind of answers and we would continue to get um, tangled in uh, the same patterns, get tangled up in conflict with each other, um, continue to work with the same people uh, because of the belief systems that keep us in that pattern. So it became clear to me quite early on from what I was learning in my own practice with this work, how it was able to help me actually um, open my mind see things differently, um, stay open in situations that were very stressful or painful, um, navigate great areas of um, stressful uncertainty. Um, I could really see how this practice would be so helpful there. Um, and that's one of the things that I find um, in my work in leadership and that I really value in the work that Alia does with leadership um, and that I really value that we do in the work in the art of hosting uh, is bringing our personal practices together with the practices that we do with groups of people and the practices that we do out in the world uh, where we're trying to make change, where we're trying to do things in new ways. Uh, I think it's not possible to do uh, one without the other. Um, and so there's a lot of great practices out there and um, through this series and I'm sure your own travels in your work, uh, you've come across some uh, good ways of, of doing that. There's certainly some wonderful um, meditation practices, grounding practices, um, uh, different kinds of tools and structures um, that we learn here that are very helpful with that. Um, and this particular practice, the work, um, what I find that brings to my toolbox uh, gives me a way to work very directly and specifically with my own thinking, with my own beliefs, my own worldview, right in the places um, that I get most stuck, right in the places where I'm most triggered, most challenged, um, right in those places where I've been trying to um, shift uh, a pattern using problem solving, using other practices and methods, and I'm not um, entirely getting the learning that I need there, or I'm continuing to be stuck, or I notice that um, despite my best uh, intentions to be present, let go, um, it's not happening. Um, and so that's a place where I apply this practice. Um, and it has not only helped me to uh, let go in those situations. It's not only helped me to uh, be more present and more open in those situations, but it's also given me just a profound, um, a profound sense of my own learning. Um, and I think this, uh, this idea of transformation um, that we're talking about here is not just about transforming uh, our own. Uh, not just about transforming the world, there's certainly a huge important work to be done out there in terms of transforming our systems and our communities and the ways that we work with each other. Um, but there's also just this uh, very valuable life journey of evolving and transforming ourselves. Um, and in order to be able to do that, um, at this level of deeper understanding of ourselves is so valuable. And this particular tool of the work has given me some um, insight into some of the areas that I haven't been able to um, access in other ways and allowed um, quite amazing and profound learning there for me. So why does it help to work with my own thinking? Where does it help to work with my own thinking? Um, what we're looking at, particularly with this practice of the work, is looking at places in my thinking um, 
in the category that we would often call uh, negative thinking. I like to just notice it as a place where uh, my thinking or my mind is contracting. Um, and sometimes that'll show up for me uh, more noticeably where I feel my system contracting or my emotions contracting. Um, but then I track that back to uh, where is it, what moment, what belief um, is it where my mind is starting to um, close down. And to me that's an invitation then to be curious. Uh, this work isn't about getting rid of any thoughts, it's actually about inviting the wholeness of our mind uh, to the table, to the conversation. Um, and the work helps us focus on that area of our thinking, um, areas of conflict, places where we're experiencing stress, fear, judgment, um, and looking for places where we really are wanting more courage and we don't have it, uh, places that we're wanting to step into uh, greater, more clear leadership for ourselves and we're noticing that's not happening um, because we're either shutting down or we're in fear or we're falling into our habitual patterns. Um, this work gives us a place to work with that area of our mind um, to help us navigate the areas of uncertainty uh, that we come across so much in the world um, as, a, as a core component of life um, and certainly as something that shows up a lot when we're trying to do things in a new way and when we're working with change. Um, in order to be able to do that well, we need to be able to sit in uncertainty. We need to be able to uh, navigate uncertainty with the full capacity of our minds and hearts available to us. Um, and when we're attached to beliefs and thinking uh, that's contracting us, uh, when we're in fear, when we notice that we're judgmental, when we're operating from uh, an unquestioned uh, set of assumptions uh, that cause us in some situations or other people, um, when our mind uh, is working in spaces where it's blaming or holding prejudice about other people, uh, those are all places where we uh, tend to be shutting down and we don't have that full capacity. And often the information um, that's, that's feeding those patterns is sitting in uh, below our level of co consciousness and sometimes what we talk about as our blind spot areas. Um, and so we're not able to just access it, uh, particularly when we're triggered. And so the work um, gives us a tool to be able to navigate some of that territory. So the work itself is a, a practice, it's a tool uh, for working with your own thinking, your own beliefs, right in the places uh, where you're stressed, where you're stuck, uh, where you're noticing that there's some kind of uh, contraction happening. It gives us a way to navigate that zone. And we focus particularly on that area of contraction because it tends to be the places where our mind is already opening open, it's working well for us. Um, and so we have that area working well, and then we have taken the time to look and see what's happening uh, when we're not able to access that area of our mind. Um, after, after such a long time in this practice, one of the things that I've become uh, very aware of um, is that our belief systems and our state of mind uh, is not on a constant setting. There's times when I can be very open, very creative, very welcoming and accepting of people, um, able to look at many perspectives on things, uh, able to imagine possibilities. And then there's other times and situations where I'm really not able to do that. Um, something is happening in my own mind, something may have been triggered from outside me uh, that is uh, stopping me from being able to do that. And although there's some great principles to help me with that, um, inviting me, myself to be present, uh, remembering to let go, um, inviting myself to fearlessness. When I'm really triggered, I've noticed, and you may have noticed for yourself as well, that it's not always so easy to do that. Um, and so this work you can apply in those places where uh, you wish that was happening um, and it isn't. So the work has a structure to it. Um, there's a, a wisdom uh, of the structure of this work that I've really come to trust and respect. Um, I have not yet come across a situation, um, even under some very uh, stressful and dire circumstances uh, for myself and people that I've worked with, uh, where this work, the structure of this work has not been able to uh, hold me um, in an inquiry, in a conversation with myself that has, um, it has always led me to a place of um, being able to open my mind and get more clarity about the situation. It's always taken me back into the direction of opening um, in quite a wise and skillful way. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about um, how the structure of this uh, work works. Um, we're just going to do a light touch on it as we only have uh, a short time together today. 
um, when I offer this work um, in uh, workshops and retreats and when I'll be offering it um, through ELIA, there's lots of different um, applications of ways that we can use the basic structure of the work, uh, the ways that we can look at particular situations of fear, uh, particular places where people get stuck, um, how to um, identify uh, and work with um, hidden underlying assumptions, how to work with prejudice, um, there's how to work with judgment and conflict. There's lots of different ways to apply this and today I'm just going to uh, do a simple touch uh, to give you a little bit of a sense of the structure um, and then invite you to maybe go and play with it a little bit for yourself. Uh, because certainly um, there, are, there is a structure to this work and um, there is not, uh, this work doesn't give you advice and it doesn't really give you a philosophy uh, what it does give you uh, is a map, uh, a structure that can allow you to track your own thinking um, and find your own uh, wisdom about a situation and re-access your own creative mind and your own openness. And so really the power of this work is going to be in your own answers. Um, but I hope to share a little bit with you today to just um, give you a small sense of that. So the structure of the work, the work is made up of two parts. Um, the first part is learning to identify what it is that your mind is doing in those moments um, that you get you, that you're contracting and bring into more awareness your own thinking and belief patterns uh, so that it's something that you're able to uh, have in your awareness rather than um, having it in your unconscious space. Um, so the first part is to identify and then the second part is to work with um, work with those thoughts and beliefs using a series of questions um, that helps you to uh, untangle and get more clear and help your mind to shift its relationship um, with those beliefs uh, from one of uh, being closed and attached to uh, having a more open relationship uh, with those particular beliefs that you have patterns around or that have been shutting you down. So we look, we identify and question the thoughts and beliefs that are causing us stress, causing us to react, um, causing confusion, uh, they can be causing anger. Um, often uh, our thinking can be triggering fear, uh, which I find is one of the most powerful, uh, has the most, one of the most powerful shutting down effects um, and is one that's particularly uh, difficult when we're doing our work out in the world and we have fears that we're either uh, not aware of or that we are aware of and that we're unable to um, relate to in a way that's not charged and not triggering us and closing us down. Um, so any of these categories of thoughts and beliefs that keep us stuck and, um, and cause us contraction. And the practice of working through identifying and questioning these beliefs both gives us, um, by opening our mind, gives us the ability to see really helpful information about the particular person or about the particular situation. So it helps us as we move through the questions to access uh, valuable information that we might not have been able to see when we were caught in this particular way of thinking about it. And as an ongoing practice, it also helps us to cultivate a state of mind, um, and I would say a state of being that's allowed to happen uh, with an open state of mind uh, that enables us much better to be able to meet the challenges of life and uncertainty and chaos with more wisdom, openness, and presence. Um, and so it has these two pieces. It helps us work with specific situations and untangle those, get the information that we need uh, to be able to uh, proceed in a um, in a more open and uh, and in a more open way with more possibility. So it helps us with that specific situation, but also as a practice, it really trains our mind uh, to be able to uh, stay more open, to not be triggered as quickly. Um, and starts to flex those uh, muscles, create that stretch in parts of our mind um, that may not be so active, uh, particularly when we're triggered. So this first piece of the work, step one, is identifying the beliefs, um, that the thoughts and beliefs that shut us down. Um, there's many different ways to do that, and I will go through those um, in the workshops. Um, there's different exercises that we can use, uh, short, simple exercises in this step of the work that helps us to um, bring into awareness the thoughts and beliefs from particular areas. And often those questions will be uh, designed to meet the particular situation for yourself or for somebody that you're working with or for a group of people. Um, for now, we're just going to work with the general uh, 
the general umbrella of um, all of those different areas of really just looking at you know what is it that I'm believing what are the thoughts that I'm having uh, what are the beliefs that I'm attaching to uh, in those moments of contraction those are the moments that are going to give us uh, the insight into the areas that limit us um, and what we do in this piece of the, the work is actually to write them down so it's not enough to just uh, notice what they are in our minds. There's actually something that happens different in our thinking, which is what we're trying to stretch and shift when we write them down. So the invitation is to look at a particular situation. We're working with reality, not at a philosophical level, to find a particular situation that I'm working with uh, where I'm uh, experiencing this uh, stuckness or the stress and to write it down in short, simple sen sentences I'm not censoring them. I'm really allowing the raw version of my uh, stress-triggered mind to land on paper so I can see it and work with it. We've been taught not to judge and be negative. We are um, often encouraged not to uh, go to the place of uh, what's happening in our fearful mind. Um, and there's a lot of good advice to that. We're certainly not um, advocating to just take all your focus away from what's positive and bring it to what's negative or to dwell in the area of negativity. But if we don't have a way to work with that part of our mind, if we don't have a way to know that part of our mind, um, you know, in some fairly good detail, uh, we're not able to change, we're not able to learn from that part of our mind. Um, and we will end up building uh, these thoughts and beliefs uh, into our evolving life or into the new things that we're wanting to be building. We will bring it into those situations. We may be able to um, dampen it down for a little while. We may be able to use some of our um, other helpful practices to bring ourselves back to a positive place to a certain degree. Uh, but one of the things I've noticed is that as soon as I'm under stress or as soon as something really triggers that area of my mind, if I haven't worked with it and looked at it, it will take the driver's seat it will end up building itself into um, what I'm doing. And so this practice gives us a way to um, really meet that part of our mind compassionately and honestly. And so in this part, we make a list um, and we write these thoughts down. And the categories of these thoughts are judgments, our blame thoughts, um, our, our unpositivized fears, um, any assumptions that we have, any prejudicial thoughts that we have. Uh, we're writing them down so we can be aware of them and so we can work with them. So I'm going to share uh, a bit of an example with you uh, of one of the ways that I um, one of the ways that I use this work. Um, I use it in a number of ways. I um, I use this work in my own practice uh, in terms of my toolbox for um, self learning and uh, for helping me prepare for the work that I do out in the world. Often when I'm stepping into pretty challenging uh, stressful situations uh, and wanting to help other people through those kind of situations. Uh, this is my core practice for preparing myself to be in that kind of work and for engaging with myself in the places that um, I can get triggered and stuck. Uh, and then I also uh, apply this work working actually with groups of people who are stuck um, and individuals are stuck, helping them to identify what is it that's happening in their thinking, uh, bring that into their individual or group awareness. Um, and then use these questions in the work as a way to uh, nav navigate and shift that. I'm going to share with you an example here of a space where, um, where I've used this work. So uh, in, the last, in the last while, in one of the projects that I was working on, I was um, getting ready for uh, quite an intense three-day meeting. Uh, we had a, quite a lead-up time to it. It was um, outside of my own uh, country and so we had many calls uh, as a way to prepare for this meeting. Uh, it was happening in a space where we were wanting to bring together uh, this group of people from uh, government agencies, uh, people working in the community, uh, people working in some of the local businesses uh, to try to improve their way of working together, uh, increase their levels of trust. They were all working together around a particular a very um, uh, quite dramatic uh, and important area in their community where there was a lot of um, a lot of suffering happening, and so they were pulled together by this shared purpose of wanting to solve these um, solve these struggles in their community. And at the same time, they had a major history of um, 
drama between the different groups, a lot of conflict, very little trust. Um, and as I was preparing to do this work with this group, really noticing um, very sporadic turnout to the planning calls um, uh, and a lot of chaos in the planning period. And so this was getting quite stressful for me, uh, thinking of stepping into hosting this three-day meeting with these folks um, and really not being able to get an awful lot of ground, um, an awful lot of uh, pre-planning to give myself uh, the comfort that I like to um, even have a low level of as I step into these situations. It was really fascinating for me to watch how uh, every time I tried to get ground with this project, uh, something else would happen and I would feel like the rug was pulled out from underneath me. Um, and yet it felt like it was important to do. I kept having the thought, you know, that I have some, uh, that I, I, I won't step into a situation with cert without certain things in place to feel like there's been um, some good uh, shared planning in place. And none of those things were happening in this project and yet it felt so important to do. And I don't know if any of you uh, in the work that you do in the world have come across any elements of this, whether you end up uh, working with people, uh, sometimes where there's conflict, um, lack of trust, um, you know, people are dealing with time constraints and funding cuts, uh, lots of cultural differences that can uh, make things difficult. Uh, so just any of these kind of things. It's, I certainly find in this, as I'm stepping out into this work in the world, um, you know, the, the conditions are mostly uh, not all uh, perfect and laid out for me. And so one of the things that I do in a situation like this, particularly where I notice that I'm getting triggered um, and I'm really wanting to uh, step into this workspace open, it felt very important to me, particularly with the low trust in the group and the, the history of conflict and trauma, um, I knew for me that it was crucial that if I was going to be able to do this work well um, and if I was going to be able to uh, meet my own value of um, showing up in a way that was actually going to be helpful, I needed to be able to stay open. Um, I needed to have all of my capacities of listening, of connecting, um, of um, being able to be constantly changing my design and what I'm offering, um, being able to step in and out. I needed to have my ability to do all that uh, really at its highest level. And uh, I notice when I'm triggered by these things, that's not happening. And so that's an indicator for me. Uh, this is my chance to work with myself. Um, and see what is it that I'm thinking and believing in the situation uh, and apply the work uh, as a way to access that. And so in my, uh, as in, in my practice, I sat down um, numerous times actually before this project um, and just started to work with my own thinking. Um, and here's some, of, here's some of what my list would look like uh, in that situation. So it should not be so chaotic. They're so disorganized. Something bad is going to happen. We need more time. They don't listen. They're too negative. They should stop fighting. They're going to yell at me. I don't know what to offer. This is never going to work. Nothing is going to make a difference. I need this to go well. I need them to show up. I'm going to look like an idiot. They're going to judge me. We need more money for this project. My list could go on. And this is really what these lists sound like. As you're identifying the thoughts and beliefs that you want to work with, you know, I this is not my... Um, my, this is not my positive spin on the situation. And by doing this work, I'm allowing myself to pause with my stressful thinking about it rather than jumping immediately to positivity or uh, reframing. I want to get curious about what's happening here uh, with my own thinking. So in a moment, I'm just going to, um, we're going to use the little poll function uh, just as a way for you to um, touch in a little bit and just wanted to ask you, um, looking at this list, thinking about this list of uh, stressful thoughts, um, how many of you have ever had uh, one of these beliefs? How many of you have ever been uh, hooked by, triggered by, caught in uh, one of these beliefs from my list uh, of stressful thoughts when you were working in a challenging situation? So if you just want to take a moment now, I think Steve is going to um, pop the poll up for us. So how many of you have uh, ever been uh, hooked by one of these beliefs? Have you been caught in one of these uh, fears, one of these judgments of other people? You had this go through your mind and catch you. Um, and maybe Steve, you can um, let me know when the poll is done and what you, what you notice in terms of uh, the numbers on that. They will judge me. We need more money. Well, the, the 
can you hear me, Caitlin? I can hear you, Steve. <laughs> the poll results are in, and uh, you may be surprised that it's 100% uh, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, 100% is high. Thank you. Um, and there's many more thoughts like this. And so, you know, one of the things that I find really valuable about doing this work um, together in a group as well, and that I, you know, really value about some of the settings that we'll be in offering this, is we just get a chance to, to see how these beliefs are um, rampant and how these, these particular types of um, thoughts and beliefs uh, are really affecting us all. And so our ability to actually just uh, be honest with about that and start to work with it is helpful to all of us. Um, and we can start to listen for them in the groups that we're working with as well. And rather than feeling like there's something that we need to get rid of, um, just to, you know, see what happens if you pause and we actually meet them with some understanding and compassion. It doesn't mean that we believe this all the time, but it does mean that these thoughts and beliefs have some power, uh, and so we need a way to engage uh, with them. And you can see how when we believe thoughts like this, when I have a, when you have a belief like people are judging me, or they're not listening to me, or something bad is going to happen, um, you know, just notice what happens in your body. Notice what happens to your uh, mind space, to your state of mind. Um, think about gosh, if I was going to be designing a system for people or if I was going to be designing something new and I'm, and I'm stuck in some of these beliefs, what kind of, um, what kind of ways are these thoughts and beliefs going to show up in the, next level of, um, in the next level of work that I'm doing if I haven't had a way uh, to address them and get a more conscious uh, relationship with them? And often whole groups of people within a team or an organization or in a community uh, can be carrying um, patterns of these kind of beliefs. You know, I've worked in um, groups and organizations where we look to see what are some of the common limiting beliefs that people are holding um, so that we can be sure that they're clear and on the table um, and that we work with them before we move forward uh, so we're not building them in. So thank you everybody uh, for your, uh, your little bit of um, voting and sharing there. And now I'm just going to invite you as another little place of exploring your own uh, limiting beliefs and thinking. Uh, just invite you to think of a situation in your own work or life that's feeling really stressful and stuck. Uh, so it could be in your personal life, it could be uh, in a project that you're working on, um, or some, some place that you're wanting to be uh, doing something differently and it's stressful, it's not going that way. Um, and if you have a pen or paper, or maybe just if you wanted to type into the um, question box on the screen there, just take a moment to think about it. Take your mind to the situation, because we want to be working with a specific situation. Um, and maybe, you know, some of you just wanted to share in the question box, short, simple sentences, don't censor. What are some of your fearful, judgmental, stressful thoughts about that situation? Just short, simple sentences. You don't need to say what the situation is. Um, but just share some of those into the question box. So I'm not seeing any show up yet in the question box, okay. uh, nor in chat. Okay. Make sure, okay. Make sure just... I'm looking in the right place here. Hi, this is Adrian. Just jumping in there, Steve. If yeah. you look at beside the questions, uh, actually, I'll just read a few out right now. Yeah, okay, but you ahead. just read them out, okay. Adrian. Okay, that's great. It's not going to change. I will never get a job. I can't make this work. I'm not doing a good job. I can't find my focus. I'll fail. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what is expected of me. I will not see. I will. I will not be seen for who I am. I am not productive. Thank you. And I'm sure if we were to do another poll, we could find um, across the group uh, some commonality in uh, some of those thoughts and beliefs. So thank you for sharing those. And if you have your own lists, um, you know, you can hang on to those and I'll tell you a little bit at the end how you can do a little bit of practice with those uh, on your own after the, um, after the webinar. Uh, one of the things I love about this practice is that it's something that you can do um, on your own. You can apply these questions uh, working with a partner. We can do it in groups, uh, but it's also something that you can do as a written practice, um, kind of as a, a written meditation practice, uh, writing down the stressful thoughts and beliefs in these kind of lists, um, and then moving through the questions and turnarounds that I'm going to talk about in the moment uh, as a journal writing exercise. Uh, so I'll invite you at the end to play with a little bit of that um, on your own. So thank you for that. 
And so that's the first piece of the work, and it's a really valuable part. Often uh, we have some idea of what are the fears and stressful thoughts and beliefs um, and assumptions that we're carrying. We have some sense of that, but when we actually pause to watch what our mind's doing, um, we learn a lot more. I often find is probably, you know, I have like a 20% general awareness of what's going on in my mind, um, and when I pause to actually look and listen, um, I become aware of a whole lot more. And so even just that first piece, making that list and letting yourself see, okay, wow, what's going on here in my thinking, is both um, very valuable information uh, for you about that situation, um, and also an opportunity to have a little bit of compassion for yourself and by extension for other people, for this is what we're dealing with. You know, when we're, when we're triggered or when we're not able to think creatively or clearly or we can't think of a new way of doing things, um, getting some awareness of what our mind uh, is doing um, is, a, is a really helpful step. And I find that that's not enough. It's not enough for me just to know what my mind is doing um, because particularly with the really strong uh, fears and some of the really strong uh, belief structures that I have, being aware of them doesn't actually allow me to shift them. I can add a little bit of curiosity to that. I can certainly have some atten a, a intention to pay attention to it, um, but the way that it's hooked into my belief system uh, runs deeper than that, and so I, I need a way to engage with that. And so we go to the second uh, part of the work. So the second part, the first part was to identify the beliefs, and the second part is to use the four questions and turnarounds of the work. This is the little uh, inquiry structure to help me to um, navigate, untangle, um, unhook, learn about uh, what's going on for me in that belief. And for this part, we actually only work with one belief at a time. So you may have a whole long list of uh, beliefs and stressful thoughts about a situation, and as we move to this next step of the work, we actually only take one. And so I, I put the rest of the list aside, um, and I choose one. So from my list of beliefs, for example, I could choose they don't listen. Um, they don't listen to me. And that's the only one I'm going to work with in this situation. It doesn't mean that the other thoughts won't be affected um, and won't have some benefit and openness from my inquiry because these thoughts and beliefs work in patterns. Um, but what it does do is allow my mind to get still and to go deeply into one part of the pattern uh, around this particular belief. You've probably noticed, even with the list you've written now, that our mind can bounce around uh, thoughts like that. Nobody's listening, they're going to judge me, there isn't enough money, it'll just go round and round in circles, um, closing, 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 and building your stress. Um, and so this helps our mind to pause and helps it to be curious about just um, one of the beliefs at a time. The invitation for this piece is really to be in a space of contemplation and curiosity. Um, I, I, uh, I think of it as a meditation, so it's a place to uh, invite my mind to slow down. Uh, to be curious, and I'm not in a pro problem-solving mode. What I'm doing is using these questions as a way to slow it down um, and to open my mind, allowing each question to um, let my mind open from a particular angle and allowing my own answers to arise. So, you know, prepare to be surprised. Prepare to listen in. You may find some of some that you've heard before from yourself, and if you're really still with it, um, you can see and hear um, some wisdom from yourself that you don't have access to when you're moving so quickly. So the four questions, um, the this part, the inquiry, is made up of the four questions and what are called the turnarounds of the work. Um, and we take the one belief that we're working with, so for an, this example that I was working with, they don't listen to me, and we answer each of these questions one at a time. So the first question um, is, is it true? And this may sound like an obvious question, but it's actually one that we often do not um, pause to really contemplate, uh, particularly when we're working from uh, deeply held belief systems, when we're stressed or when we're uh, fearful. We can believe something and move very quickly into our pattern around it um, or our lack of awareness around it uh, without even really pausing. And so the invitation of the first two questions <clears throat> is to really pause and contemplate that. Is this belief true? They don't listen to me. <clears throat> um, and so I'm going to pause with that. And for the first two questions, the answer is actually only yes or no. Um, this is really helping your mind to make some clear delineation here. Probably that's not the only answers you'll get. You'll get a lot more noise of, yeah, but, but what about in this situation? But just keep sitting with the question um, and commit. 
So the first question, they don't listen to me, is it true? And I'm going to take the opportunity to pause and consider that. Um, if my answer is uh, yes, it is true, then I move to the second question, which gives me an opportunity to contemplate it again, to look and see, is there any crack in my theory that they don't listen to me? Because it's a fairly big deal in terms of my own reaction and how I'm going to be with these people if I'm 100% sure that they don't listen to me. So I really want to test that. I really want to know, is there any crack in my theory? Um, and look at that. With these first two questions, I've noticed that once my mind has decided that it is really right, it's 100% true and it knows what the situation is, it stops being curious. Um, it stops uh, being open. And so these two questions get let, give me the opportunity to really pause um, and look for that crack. Either answer is fine. This isn't um, trying to make you be um, choosing a yes or no answer for any particular reason. The most important thing is that you take the time to look and that you find what your own honest answer is. The third question um, is how do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? So this gives you an opportunity to really pause and explore the uh, effect of on yourself, on your own thinking, your own actions, your own internal state when you attach to this thought, when you believe this thought. So when I'm believing this thought they don't listen, what happens for me? What does that feel like? Um, how do I treat them? How do I act? Um, how do I, um, what is that costing me? Um, why might I be attached to that thought? I sit and I explore that area. So I might notice with this one, they don't listen to me, that I, that I talk louder, I feel offended. I um, start to use a little bit of a patronizing voice. I notice that I don't listen to them quite as much. Um, I notice that it costs me my feeling of connection to them. Um, it costs me uh, being relaxed and creative with them. And I would continue to explore, um, there's a bunch of little questions in there in these little categories of how I feel and, and how I react that can help you navigate that area. And I explore that um, in an open-minded space from anywhere from a few minutes to half an hour. Um, you can really expand uh, or contract the length of time that you sit in this process. So I take some time to really explore that. It's an opportunity for self-learning, an opportunity to, for me to see what is the pattern that comes with this belief. Um, when I've done that question, then I would move to who would I be without the thought? Um, and I get to look again. So when my mind's attached to the thought, I get to see what happens, and now I get to just go into a, a contemplative space and explore what would the same situation be like for me if I wasn't believing that thought, if I wasn't attached to this belief that they don't listen to me. Uh, let me go back and sit in it again in my mind and see what would that be like. What would that be like in me? What might I notice? Um, how might I react in that situation if I wasn't locked onto this belief? And again, that's a personal experience. Um, to sit in some meditative space and explore that for yourself. Um, and again, you can take as much time as you want and need with that. And so that's the four questions. Um, anywhere from five minutes to quite a long period of time, you can sit in that. And each question, um, stretching your mind in a different way about this belief. Once you've answered the four, four questions, then we go to what are called the turnarounds, um, which gives you a way to open your mind to what else is possible to explore the other perspectives, and to ground that by finding genuine, specific examples from reality. It's really um, a much deeper process than reframing. Although it looks a little bit like reframing because we're switching the belief around to um, the positive perspectives or the different perspectives, uh, my experience is that once I've actually really sat in the four questions of the work, and I arrive at this part of the process with my mind uh, much more open, um, I'm able to see perspective um, and see it in a kind of detail that's very helpful to me uh, that I might not have been able to see before. And so I'm just going to give you a very quick um, touch on what that is because I'd like to have some time for questions. Um, and there's lots more um, spaces that you can experience the details of this. I'll give you some information at the end so you can look it up in more detail and play with it yourself a little bit. Um, but the structure of the turnaround um, is to take each uh, of a number of different perspectives, staying with the same wording of the belief, the place that it's caught in your mind, um, and turn it around in a number of different ways uh, and find very specific examples of how that's true in that situation. 
these examples um, that you take the time to find can be extremely helpful. Um, if I'm going to be able to show up in a situation in a new way, uh, if I'm going to be able to see aspects of that situation that I couldn't see before, um, I can use each of the turnarounds to give me some time uh, and mind space to do that. So I'm going to stop there um, without a lot more detail about how the turnarounds work and maybe just open up uh, a little bit of space, uh, a little bit of space for questions. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I'm looking at the question list now and I'll, I'll uh, convey those to you as they uh, show up. We have time, about five minutes for questions. And I'll join you. <laughs> okay. And you can let me know those questions. And then also any questions that we don't get answered now. Um, you know, obviously it's not a huge amount of time. I think there's some uh, space, maybe Adrian will talk about it at the end, um, on the Alia site uh, for mm -hmm. people to post questions and us to have some ongoing discussion. And I'm very happy to engage there um, as well as at the event. Well, one thing I'm curious about myself is just how this uh, journey has been for you. I mean, that's a big question, but um, you're a different person today than you were so many years ago. How would you just characterize mm -hmm. um, how you are today? Yeah, I would say that I um, I have a, a, a profoundly larger amount of self-awareness um, and that I've really noticed that the way that my mind deals with stressful situations um, is very different. Uh, and so it seems like the part of my mind that is learning and curious and paying attention uh, is larger, is much more awake. So when stressful things start to happen or when I'm stepping into a situation, uh, I find that very quickly, if I'm starting to close down or react, I can hear a reaction in my mind that says, what are you believing? And the beliefs are there. I can, I can see what they are. Um, and that creates some pause and space for me. And so my my uh, t length of time of reaction and the number of reactions that I have uh, is is uh, really a lot um, really a lot smaller, um, and that just okay. means I'm get to stay with myself more, uh, which okay. is you know helpful. And we do have a few questions coming in. Uh, the first okay. one here is, do you find the work is most helpful with something that involves another person in relationship, or is it just as helpful in situations where you're really fighting with fighting with yourself? Hmm. Um, I find both. So um, there is uh, there is a whole focus of, of the work that is around relationship and around judgments and working with other people um, and it's extremely helpful in that area and um, I also uh, apply the work across the board. I find anywhere that my mind um, anywhere that my mind is contracting and getting stuck this work is really helpful to me so I don't limit it at all to um, relationships with other people. I find underneath um, any of these categories of contraction, uh, there tends to be a fearful mind. Um, and so finding a way to uh, identify what are the beliefs that are setting off uh, my patterns about myself or other people, um, it's just a matter of navigating in and finding what's happening in my mind there. Okay. Uh, let's take another one. Uh, how does the work change when, when it doesn't involve a them, such as, I don't know enough or I can't do this? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you can work directly on those thoughts. It is it is helpful to, um, I find it's helpful to work on thoughts projected out or to look for the underlying fears uh, because our beliefs about ourselves tend to be the most well defended in our mind and so if you're new mm. to the practice, um, it, it can be a little trickier. Uh, we, our minds can get, uh, you know, tucking things away. But if you tell me those two beliefs again, I can, um, I might be uh, able to It was, I don't know enough or I can't do this. Hmm. Yeah, so some of the ways uh, some of the ways I might work with that is to also look at other ways of framing that. So I need to know more. Um, what am I afraid will happen if I don't know everything and look what my fears are. So I would just take those and, and come at them in slightly not just as self um, beliefs, but look and see what's underneath that. And then I would work with that. Uh, I think we have time for one more. This one might be a little involved. What if you answer yes to the is it absolutely true question, how do you work with the turnarounds? Okay. Um, so I would say if yes, if yes is true for you, then absolutely answer yes. I love the honesty of that and being honest with yourself is the most important 
part of this practice. So you can do the work and answer, yes, it's true. Can you absolutely know that it's true? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. it is. And I can still work with how do I react? What happens? Who would I be without it? And then when you turn it around, if you really spend some time in, um, in the four questions, you may be surprised. I have had multiple times working with myself and other people where I've been 100% sure the belief is true, and I've still been able to find turnarounds to the opposite uh, by the time I get there. Um, I've still been able to find places where how it turns around to me is really good information for me, or how it turns around to the other person is really good information for me. Because it's not about getting rid of the thought. Uh, it's really about changing my relationship to the thought um, so that I can stay open and present, so that I'm available to engage with what's happening. Um, I've worked um, with some of my own thoughts very strongly, even staying with uh, yes in both, and it's been very helpful to me. So don't I wouldn't let that stop me. Just uh, okay. spend time in the questions and trust the process and see what you learn. All right. Thank you. Um, there are many more questions, um, but I would like to invite you, Caitlin, at the moment, in this moment, if you would share um, something about the upcoming module at the ALIA Summer Leadership Intensive in Tacoma. What are you sure. going to be, what kind of work will you be doing that day, for those days? Great, for those days. Well, um, what I what will be great about having that amount of time together, um, we'll do a basic uh, touch in on the process like we've done today, but then move quite quickly into different applications of the work. Uh, so I really like to spend some time working around fear, uh, looking at places mm. that we get stuck. People will have the opportunity to bring uh, their own situations to the module. So we'll be very much um, engaged working with um, what's real for you, what are some of the stuck places for you, and then coming at that from some different angles. Um, using the work, doing some practice together in the circle, um, I'll do some facilitation uh, to lead us through some of that, and people will also have the opportunity to partner with each other, uh, so you have the chance to work through uh, you know, quite a bit of your own uh, stuck places that you bring, and to be able to learn how to um, you know, do some basic facilitation of each other so that you can take it out into your own practice. And as a follow-up to today's webinar, uh, are you open to some connection via social media, LinkedIn or Facebook, uh, for people to who didn't get their questions addressed? Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. I think I know there's some space in the Alia um, in the on the Alia page for that, and I'm also right, I right. put my website and my email address, so I'm happy to. I'm happy to hear from people. Um, and there's some okay. posting there about some of my other retreats and um, workshops as well. Okay. Well, what I'd like to do then is uh, share some information about the uh, remaining webinars in this series and also about the uh, summer leadership intensive coming up and then come back to you in a couple of minutes and have you offer us some uh, final inspiring thoughts. <laughs> so I'll give you a moment to prepare that. Um, if you would advance the slide for me there. There you go. Okay. So just want to let folks know that we have a, a number of uh, very cool webinars coming up. Um, next Wednesday, uh, Peter Senge will be with us. And uh, I haven't heard from him in a while, and I'm really looking forward to that myself. Uh, he'll be talking about frontiers of deep innovation. That will be followed um, very quickly by Adam Kahane talking about his new book and work, Transformative Scenario Planning, followed by Bob Stilger sharing his experiences of working uh, in Japan at the site of the uh, tsunami, earthquake, and nuclear disasters. So he's got uh, a lot of uh, powerful experiences to share with us. And then I think uh, the last in this series, unless we add some more, will be Art Kleiner uh, talking about collective mastery in organizations. Uh, these are all going to be very good, I think. Next slide. And then, oh, there, there's the uh, contact information for Caitlin to the website and email. And just to remind everyone about the uh, Summer Leadership Intensive coming up, Tacoma, June 8th through 13th at Pacific Lutheran University. These are some of the folks who are going to be there. Uh, Caitlin, of course. Uh, Art Kleiner, we mentioned. Wendy Palmer, uh, who is an Aikido master, uh, and we'll be talking about embodied leadership. Charles Eisenstein in Sacred Economics. Dan Siegel, Mindsight Institute, will be with us uh, virtually uh, on, I think, Monday the 1st and Bob Stilger is one of the faculty, and there are many more. Uh, if you go to the uh, website for the Alia Institute, 
um, you'll be able to see the entire program. And I'm quite excited about it, and I will be there myself. All right, Caitlin, can you close for us? You can. Yeah, so just wanted to um, thank you so much, Steve, and thank you everyone uh, who's participated and Elia for organizing this, um, and look forward to the future webinars and to meeting up uh, in T Tacoma for some good uh, inquiry and learning together. Uh, and just as a little closing, I love this quote uh, around leadership from Byron Katie. Uh, the most powerful leadership tool you can have uh, is an open mind. Um, and for me, this really just points to the self-practice uh, piece of this work. Certainly, we have um, so many uh, tools and we have great intelligence. And um, so many of us have you know, all of our experience from our life and our work in the world. Uh, we have a vast capacity for... Uh, using our minds and our hearts um, and really uh, what we need to be able to do is to continue to learn and continue to access uh, that capacity in ourselves. There's really uh, no other way to do it. If we want to find profoundly new ways of being in the world, if we want to find uh, really connection to our full life and our full offering of our gifts, you know, in this big journey of all the challenges um, that are out there, we really need to have access to our full selves. Um, and I have found that um, being developing this awareness of uh, my own thinking and the role that that plays um, and a way to navigate it, uh, get the gifts of learning from some of the challenging areas um, and keep moving um, is a beautiful journey and a crucial journey. Um, and it's good news. It kind of brings back the, um, the power uh, and some of the um, ability to navigate. It brings it back, uh, brings it back to me. Um, and a way to find my way home to my own, uh, to my own goodness and my own creativity and um, you know my own intelligence. And if we're all, uh, the more of us that are able to do that, the better chance we have of um, being able to create and move into this new world that we're yearning for. So um, thank you. I wish you, uh, I wish you good journeys and all your good work. And um, we'll, uh, I think, post on the Alia site some resources that you can use if you want to play with this a little bit yourself. Um, doing some writing exercises. So thank you. Have a lovely day.